I'd like to extend uh, the welcome that Tony has made to this launch of a healthy research centre for North England. A welcome on behalf of myself and the Herc team. We are one of four centres across the United Kingdom with a common mission. A common mission for harnessing UK health data for patient and public benefit. Harnessing. First line on this prospectus. We don't say big data, we don't just focus on the data, we don't just focus on the linkage. The intellectually hard problem for the informatics here is the harnessing. And that's what I'd like to give you an overview of as we start today's proceedings. Why does this matter? Why does this matter? Let's say Mr. Brown here has, is a 65-year-old man with a 10-year history of type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, chronic kidney disease, uh, and high blood pressure. Mr. Brown sees a diabetologist who focuses on glycemic control. Focusing on glycemic control puts up his weight. Putting up his weight puts up his blood pressure. Putting up his blood pressure puts stress on his kidneys. So he goes to see the nephrologist who deals with the kidney failure. The nephrologist focuses on blood pressure control. Mr. Brown is asked by his GP to focus on his weight as a means of controlling his blood pressure. He has a plethora of different medications and advice coming down different pipelines. There are different guidelines for the diabetology, the nephrology, and the overall cardiovascular risk management cutting across all of these silos. But in the middle of it is a patient experience. A patient who's trying to co-produce the care and the care outcomes. So do we have the information to support that mission? Or what we currently have is an evidence base that predicts around a third of the average outcome for the average patient. Yet the experiments of everyday healthcare, the experiences that we only partially capture of Mr. Brown are not revealed in a usable form. The natural experiments are not harnessed into our evidence base. This center is dedicated to that harnessing. So how do we get new evidence from healthcare records? Data is given. There's a lot of focus on big data. Just buy me a bigger data warehouse, please. Yes, data are attractive but we have a tsunami of data. We have a blizzard of literature. Papers in ever more specific areas. So eventually we know more about less, which unfortunately converges upon knowing everything about nothing. But hopefully we won't get there. But there is specialism to handle this tsunami of data, naturally. And we build different pipelines. We have different pipelines at a very high level for research, for processing the data for research, processing the data for better commissioning, better governance and quality improvement in our services. But we have a drought of the human expertise for this really hard problem of making sense of the messy data. Messy data. Let me go to another diabetes example. Here, diabetics in Salford from a quick snapshot of the data that we were given with a question from our colleagues in AstraZeneca, are these messy real-world data usable for looking at treatment responses? And they were interested in liver function. And we said, okay, well, there'll be lots of patches in the data. So you'll have naturally have selection biases if you try to compare one group with another. But if we look at changes within individual people as they start a medication, can we get a signal out of these really messy data? And we did get a signal. So this is Matt's at the back. This is Matt's work. It's a good, solid statistical modeling to look at the change over time for the average patient with type 2 diabetes starting a glitazone. And this step size was the same size whether the patient was starting just a glitazone, a glitazone plus metformin, plus sulfonylurea, or both. And it was a similar size to that you would see from clinical trials. So a biologically plausible signal coming out of really messy data. Our answer was worse, worth looking further into these data. So conventional data. Now, they were mainly 
general practice and secondary care derived laboratory data, which mainly end up in general practice. So let's look at some UK general practice data sources. CPRD or GPRD, here are my colleagues, I think Evan's here too, who put this together using the standard codes in GPRD to just ask what is the trend over time in the prevalence of diabetes? It's a simple question. And you'll see all these lines going across. So there's a difference here of 1% to 4%. So quite a big difference in the prevalence of an important condition that we're investing a lot in in the health service and we're concerned about from a public health perspective. So thin Q research quaff. We're getting different answers, but they, over time, they're going with the same gradients, which suggests this is a calibration problem, but it's fixable. Now consider the codes behind. A general practitioner for Mr. Brown might have written DMR oblique O in a diabetes code, i.e. diabetes ruled out. So the code didn't actually mean what a simple grab of the data would assume that it meant. Colleagues in Stanford looked a little deeper behind the codes. They looked just at the coded data to see could they detect the heart attack risk of rofecoxib Vioxx before it was withdrawn from the market. They couldn't from the coded data. They didn't have sufficient statistical power, not enough data was coded. But by text mining the records that were there on a large series of people with rheumatoid arthritis, they got the signal well before the withdrawal date. So we have a duty to dig out the signals if the signals are in the data, not just to say this is a really hard problem, observational research, keep it at arm's length. Let me move to more adventurous statistical analysis and different ways of talking about models between investigators. So here we're asking the question, can we look at the structure in data to shape hypotheses, to influence the way we talk about the underlying mechanisms at a very early stage of investigation? Here we looked at 1,000 children from South Manchester, measured with a bank of allergens here from Mike to Peanut, at age one, three, five, and eight. Now we can't measure directly the allergic sensitization. We have indirect measures, skin prick tests, blood tests. So we have this latent factor underneath, this is allergic sensitization, about which we are trying to infer a probability of gaining or losing sensitization as the child is growing up and their immune system is developing and their propensity to allergies is changing. So, we pushed the data on the sensitization in a structure that started with a model of what we assumed was plausible, and we looked for subgroups of those children to try and bust the myth, do children just fall into one of two camps? Those with an allergic tendency, atopic children, or those without an allergic tendency? The answer was no. We found five camps, five latent classes in the data, this was structure that we then went and did some descriptive statistics around those subgroups. And what characterized them was some were predominantly non-dust mite sensitizations, some were predominantly dust mite, some were late as the child was growing up, and there was this group of multiple early sensitizations which had an odds ratio of about 31 for subsequent asthma. No matter how you measured the asthma, from parent report, through to a metacholine challenge in the laboratory. An important finding helped by looking at the structure in the data in a statistically disciplined way. Now for models, statistical models that are out there informing decisions in the health service in a new legal context, which some may not be aware of. European Directive 2007-47 said that any algorithm used for a prognostic, therapeutic, or diagnostic purpose was deemed to be a medical device and needed to be validated as such. Let us consider an algorithm that goes into decision support for people who are about to undergo heart surgery. So this is the risk of dying from a coronary artery, a bypass graft procedure, 
And the expected from the model that was fitted around here in the late 90s is in the red line. What's actually observed is in the black. So you can see a big drift in calibration. That model is no longer fit for purpose. So we must think, how can these health e-research centers keep the production line of models plumbed <coughs> in to the sources of data and those who are assessing their strengths and weaknesses? Here's an example of service and science coming together. I think quite a few of the Salford Lund study team are here, John, Mark, and others. So this is a really good example to bring it to life of where we're getting science embedded in improving the health service. Think in an Amazon way, okay? You go shopping for something on Amazon. Other people have shopped for other things like this. Might you be interested in it? Machines in the background using the big data to create links between people and influence behaviors and how they use the data subsequently. So in this study where we're looking uh, to combine beta agonist and steroid, well, there's an issue around compliance, so the business case for a more convenient therapy and an assumption that there'll be a better outcome because you only have to take this thing once a day rather than the alternatives are twice a day. Now, concordance with medication in some papers has a link to deprivation. So this is taking place in Salford. The public health team over here in Salford know that the deprivation scores for Salford were wrong because the crime statistics were wrong. So you can't use the stuff you can download from the government website. You have to reconstruct the deprivation information. So there's a piece of knowledge here of how to reconstruct an appropriate piece of information from raw data that ideally in an Amazon-like way, people over here would just automatically inherit because they're touching an intelligently engineered system. This is what we're working towards. We can't do it right now. But by getting a very large-scale trials platform embedded in the sort of place where the public health people are saying, oh, might that be useful for us? Where the clinical audit people are looking at readmissions risk and deprivation, we start to use that scarce human resource more effectively. This, I would <coughs> contest, is more than data linking to machines, linking to decision makers in isolation. It's a social machine. So the aspiration that we are looking for in engineering here is that of a social machine, of making sense of messy real world data for patient and public benefit. So to build an infrastructure, and we have a, a services arm pulled by the NHS that is developing, is answering problems raised by the NHS in Northwest eHealth. This is looking to pull the data together across local communities. If you can create that kind of electronic or digital laboratory in which you have not only pointers to data, but you have who did what with the data, the statistical script, the report, the slide deck, everything's linked. The ingredients for doing one like that, you shop for in your basket. So it's 20% of the work instead of 100% to get to that position of asking the next hard question. If we can do this across multiple localities, the NHS can benefit by multiplying the scarce capacity of analysts out there to handle the tsunami of data. If we can do this across academic health science centers and networks and other marriages between higher education and healthcare, we can leverage a greater sample size for more timely and more accurate observational research. And moreover, we can start to exploit the heterogeneity of having these multiple localities with their strengths and weaknesses of the data and people pouring over the signals coming out. Data not only from conventional clinical forms, but looking to the future, data very much from patients directly, from mobile phones. So here's an MRC-funded project, CareLoop, building on the ClinTouch project with mobile phones, held and designed applications, co-designed with people with schizophrenia to look at their experience of symptoms in relation to therapy, to give the heads up to the person at the center of this, 
about their symptoms in a cognitive behavioral type model. By doing this kind of app development in a scholarly environment, you start asking, what are the underlying cognitive models in relation to interacting with a prompt on your mobile phone? If it calls me by my name, am I more likely to answer it rather than it being impersonal? If it varies the times of day rather than being predictable, is it becoming more engaging and more interesting? So a cognitive modeling piece that the marketing people know quite well, engineered in a way that tries to optimize the longitudinal signal that we would get for the value of both the person using the application and the wider care team who are trying to titrate their resources to where they're most needed. So instead of six weekly visits, we get a channeling a resource to the person who seems to be going off their meds. Better use of the service. So pulling this all together, I haven't got time to describe all of the underpinning work of many of the people in this room contributing. There's a prospectus here that gives you an overview of our different themes. We'll be describing those themes in our client throughout the day. We are very grateful that the research councils have acknowledged this is an intellectually hard problem, a very difficult interdisciplinary area, and to solve it, you need to do it at a large enough scale. So we have a collection of funders who've acknowledged this potential virtuous circle between service and science of linking not only data, but data, methods, and people to really harness those signals. We have our partners across the region. And I put a placeholder here, because as well as the existing partners at our inception, we have a lot of great science ideas coming through from those who we didn't have enough funding for in the first round. Our colleagues at Sheffield and Leeds and Newcastle, there's a growing conversation. And I'm quite inspired by that. Um, but I'll finish on a, on a personal note. It's, there's a lot of signal locked in data sets. Um, I've recently been kicking myself over the potential benefits of N-acetylcysteine in both pulmonary fibrosis treatment, which is used for best guess treatment, and there's new evidence coming through it might be useful in cachexia and end-of-life care for people with cancer, something that touched my own family. The data of many of those natural experiments, I know, are out there. And in terms of patients and the public, I know that many people, many families would feel to not to use the data is unethical. And we're solving a very hard problem now and it may not be the current generation that benefit, but we're in this for the long game, and hopefully future generations will be able to harness this collective hindsight of the natural experiments of everyday healthcare. Thank you for listening.